this is the last lecture in the materials chemistry course which I have titled as uh, perceptions and projections. Uh, so far we have uh, looked at various aspects of materials um, and the course has been divided uh, mainly into two uh, parts one to do deal with different approaches to make materials and how to characterize them and the other major part has been to study uh, in terms of it uh, applications in photonics, electronics and in magnetism. Uh, in the uh, first uh, few modules we have stressed in the on the need for chemistry roots and how chemical uh, principles can be applied to make uh, materials and specially nano materials in bulk form and in thin film forms and also as uh, single crystals how materials uh, can be made using soft and uh, unconventional wet chemical roots. Uh, in the second part of this course we have mainly looked at topical studies basically on uh, magnetism and uh, on the electronic properties and on photonic properties. Um, I would like to quickly recap in this lecture uh, on uh, some of the essential things that we touched upon uh, as uh, projections in the uh, very first lecture I had mentioned what we would be studying in this course. I just want to recap on all those items or uh, issues that we have seen so far and uh, also in between I will try to project some of the crucial research evidences that are needed in materials chemistry which will deeply affect the applications. So, let me quickly run through some of the uh, slides which will give us a quick recap of what we have seen in the last uh, um, 30 uh, odd lectures and then we will see uh, how we can uh, look forward to extending some of these materials which has shown potential applications. <coughs> To start with uh, we listed uh, several modules that would comprise this course module 1 to 7 and each of this module uh, was particularly designed to drive home a uh, theme and uh, module 1 was uh, mainly highlighted uh, in order to uh, bring about the issues related to chemical synthesis and we have seen over half a dozen of uh, chemical uh, roots and uh, we will also quickly touch upon some of the uh, chemical uh, principles that we have learnt in this course and in module 2 we have seen some of the um, characterization techniques which are inevitable to elucidate the structure of new and uh, known materials that we prepare. Chapter 3 is uh, about um, the characterization techniques and chapter 2 uh, we have looked at the physical roots that is uh, thin film uh, roots and in 4 to uh, 6 we have looked at the several case studies on different uh, materials. Uh, as I told you that uh, materials chemistry uh, and the need for studying materials chemistry as a course mainly because it is integrating almost all the branches of chemistry physical, organic, inorganic and uh, polymer chemistry all this together uh, put together gives a very good flair for understanding materials world. Therefore, uh, materials chemistry almost acts like a hub to bring uh, several uh, researchers uh, to a common platform. Therefore, um, there is no more demarcation between physical, organic or inorganic that is one of the very, very important influence of materials chemistry and not only within the uh, branch of chemistry, but uh, around the sphere of chemistry we have seen technology, material science, biology and physics all merging together with materials chemistry <laughs> principles or activities and therefore, it has led to a very a crucial role for materials chemistry to uh, bring many branches of science and engineering together. Therefore, it has been an interesting journey for us to see how so many groups can merge to, um, yeah, to attack uh, new materials which are uh, useful for functional applications. Uh, 
uh, one of the uh, few um, insights that we have derived from material synthesis that is in module 1 is to understand new material uh, principles uh, especially those which are not known to um, a common uh, chemist and in that uh, we have actually looked at uh, conventional wet chemical routes and non-conventional wet chemical routes and the conventional one most of us are um, obviously uh, exposed to, but here also I have brought in a, a, a number of uh, discussions or a number of examples on combustion route which is not well known, but still it is one of the most popular emerging uh, tool in uh, wet chemistry routes. Uh, and also I have discussed with you about solids solution precursor technique, which is uh, one of the very useful uh, approaches to make materials in a very uh, quantitative way. And uh, uh, I will also show uh, some of our recent results to impress upon uh, the solid solution precursor technique, why it is going to govern uh, the metals chemistry field uh, uh, for a longer time period. Uh, in non-conventional route, we have emphasized on microwave based uh, research and using uh, sonar chemistry which is a secondary effect on making materials. It is not a direct interaction, but we use the secondary effect to make nano materials and we also have looked so far into other uh, non-conventional routes that is hydrothermal and crystal growth techniques. Um, we will look at uh, one of the example that I showed in the precursor uh, route uh, in, in the early part of this course. Uh, that is on solid solution precursors and this was one of the view graph that I showed to highlight how using a single molecule we can uh, we can di diversify our area of interest. For example, start with uh, aluminum Q3 complex, um, aluminum Q3 which, which is a well known organic uh, semiconductor compound which has a very high mobility, very high photoluminescence. But using this compound as a base material, merely doping some amount of lanthanum or some amount of chromium or strontium or yttrium, you can actually get into diverse areas of application where you can prepare LaAlO3 which is a very good uh, <coughs> template or uh, single crystal that is used in thin film industry. We can use uh, uh, the same approach to prepare YAG which is a laser material, ruby which is a laser material and strontium aluminate which is a phosphor material. So, just start with an organic molecule, but you end up with several inorganic photonic materials that is the power of the solid solution precursor route and uh, we have shown using aluminum uh, Q3. Also, we can uh, we have emphasized in this novel uh, solid solution precursor what is fundamental to this approach. We have shown in ALQ3 or chromium doped, cobalt doped, aluminum, uh, lanthanum doped or yttrium doped ones. The main emphasis there is the solid solution and the solid solution is nothing but those which show same X-ray crystallography or same uh, uh, crystal morphology. In other words, we talk about a isostructural situation. So, if all the um, components are showing isocrystal nature, structural nature, then it is possible for you to put any amount of different metals as long as you can preserve the same uh, crystal symmetry and we have shown how all this can act as precursors to get a range of compounds. And as you see all these precursors before they are calcined to the respective oxides, they are all photoluminescent and uh, such uh, such precursors have been reported for the first time and uh, we also uh, have shown uh, in the previous example how this sort of technologically important oxides can be prepared out of this. Uh, we have also shown in, in one of the earlier uh, lectures how zinc Q2 can also be used. This is something similar to AlQ3 what we have seen in the previous two slides. Zinc Q2 is a potential precursor again using the concept of solid solution we can dope cadmium in ZnQ2 because cadmium Q2 and ZnQ2 are isostructural. So, if you put one in other you do not see any phase segregation 
and this can act as a very good precursor for cadmium do doped zinc oxide. And similarly, we can start with uh, zinc Q2 and doped with manganese and we can get zinc oxide doped with manganese. I will come in next few slides to show you some of our own recent result and emphasize why the solid solution precursor route is going to go a long way. And uh, similarly, we can prepare ZnQ2 with nickel doping and you can get nickel doped zinc oxide which is also ferromagnetic in nature. <coughs> a breakthrough result leading to dilute magnetic semiconductors we can derive from the solid solution approach and as you would see in the next uh, few slides that uh, this is the uh, f uh, dilute magnetic semiconductor that we are talking about. This is a uh, ordinary semiconductor and when you put uh, paramagnetic uh, uh, ions then they show uh, paramagnetism of this order which is usually seen in 3, 6, uh, 2, 6 semiconductors. But once you add holes to it then you can ferromagnetically order these spins and as a result you can actually get uh, um, <coughs> ferromagnetic signal in gallium nitride doped with manganese. So, this is a uh, um, emerging fast emerging one and uh, uh, other uh, suitable example is manganese doped gallium arsenate. These are turning out to be dilute magnetic semiconductors at room temperature. Now, we have also taken the same uh, challenge, but we want to incorporate this magnetic impurities exactly in the zinc site uh, in ZNO and uh, using the solid solution precursor as you would see here, we can try to get a very highly stoichiometric compound um, in the form of ZN um, manganese oxide which is 2 percent manganese or uh, 10 percent manganese and one important thing is this is log intensity plot that is why you see too noisy when you plot it in log intensity even smaller impurities can be highlighted and you can see very well here that there is no extra peak even in log intensity which means even at 10 percent you do not see any phase segregation of manganese and this is very important because this is the first time ever we are able to see such a trend in manganese doped zinc oxides uh, reported either by chemi chem chemical roots or in thin film form. Now, the most important uh, feature that I want, uh, want to draw your attention to is this magnetization versus, um, uh, versus field plot and for the first time we are seeing any sample that is heated above 600 degrees or say at 900 degree uh, C is showing a very strong uh, ferromagnetic signal. Th it has never been reported in any of the earlier literature reports where magnesium doped zinc oxide shows magnetic behavior at room temperature uh, for any compound that is heated beyond 700 degrees. Why? Because it is a impurity which gets transformed beyond 700 and therefore, only that impurity induced phase is active below 700 degree C. So, for the first time we are showing that if you take a precursor route, it is possible to carefully dope manganese in the zinc site without any phase segregation. As a result, we can stabilize a dilute magnetic semiconducting phase and this is one, uh, one of the very novel result that would take this uh, wet chemistry route to a long way. <coughs> Uh, what is the beauty and why we are able to uh, stabilize such a magnetic phase even though you heat it up to high temperature is uh, the simple uh, analogy that you can get out of a thermogravimetric analysis. As you would see here all this BZT is a benzthiazole based compound. So, if you are actually doping uh, this and you are thermally decomposing you can clearly see that the decomposition is extended up to 600 degree C where the manganese oxygen bond seems to be much stronger than zinc oxide bond. As a result as long as manganese oxygen bond is there it is not going to allow any other secondary phase to form. So, the simple thermogravimetric analysis clearly gives an account for why a delayed formation of impurity phase is affected and this is a simple procedure by which we can uh, effectively dope magnetic impurities into a semiconductor. 
as you would see here uh, we can even try with other uh, substitutions or other ligands a similar trend is noted therefore this is for the first time we are documenting that a solid solution precursor can be used to unravel this mystery and uh, we ha also have introduced several other wet chem chemical roots uh, and uh, non wet chemical uh, roots or non conventional roots one of the thing that we have highlighted is the use of so sono chemical synthesis and uh, as I, uh, we have already discussed its uh, cavitation process which gives a hot spot and this hot spot is able to stabilize nanomaterials and through this uh, ultrasound effect we can make a host of nanomaterials which uh, which can be rendered in different form uh, either as a sulfide or as a oxide or as a poly uh, or as a support on uh, a catalyst surface uh, we can realize this in many forms uh, provided we start with the right combination and conditions uh, one highlight of the sonar chemical process is that you can prepare everything in amorphous form which means you can go down to 1 to 2 nanometer in size and because of the strength of able to prepare nanomaterials in uh, such a uh, s such a small dimension what we have seen is what is observed as a magnetic phase in crystalline uh, situation where uh, 20 and 30 percent of uh, uh, platinum doped alloys are supposed to be ferromagnetic whereas this is supposed to be non-magnetic in crystalline phase but in amorphous we are able to see that in all cases it is turning out to be to be uh, ferromagnetic. So, this is completely uh, confusing the uh, predictions uh, rendered by um, uh, by crystalline phases or uh, by equilibrium phase diagram. So, um, the sono chemical approach seems to uh, hold a lot of potential to prepare materials which cannot be ferromagnetically uh, ordered at room temperature and this is mainly because of uh, unusual interaction of the sound waves with matter. Therefore, we foresee that lot more uh, excitements are in store uh, using uh, sono chemical process. We have also highlighted the use of uh, microwave, how microwaves can be used for a controlled reaction, a chemical reaction. It could, be, uh, it could require a thermodynamic condition or a kinetic condition. In either way, microwave synthesis seems to take care of the kinematically controlled and thermodynamically controlled processes and uh, this is one of the view graph that we have shown earlier to show how such uh, processes can be used lot of conventional uh, commercial instruments are now available for material synthesis this is one such view graph to highlight how zinc oxide can be made and how these are made as nanopods and uh, uh, how exposure of microwave can influence the photoluminescence studies. For example, we have shown that if you just expose the zinc oxide for 2 hours in microwave, you get this characteristic 380 nanometer uh, peak. Whereas, if you are going to expose the microwave for a longer time at 4 hours, you totally kill this 380 nanometer emission and what you see is a defect induced emission that is coming. So, this gives a clear idea how the chemical synthesis has to be fine tuned and controlled and how they can be very selective and specific in making materials of different composition. And also I have highlighted where um, uh, whenever you look for metastable phases or unusual oxidation states uh, in oxides you can always resort to a very very important uh, approach that is hydrothermal and I have also shown in this view graph these are beautiful crystals of CrO2 which is used in magnetic recording industry and how uh, gems can also be made selectively using hydrothermal condition. We looked at all the requirements for making compounds with different morphology and composition and how hydrotherm uh, hydrothermal um, route can uh, help us resolve this. Uh, we also looked at uh, several combination of techniques in physical vapor me method. One of the most important one that we saw is uh, uh, the use of molecular beam epitaxy which we call as MBE and in this MBE approach I have uh, shown you examples of how to start from the scratch. You can put atomic layer by atomic layer to even develop a single unit cell and then you can go for multi layers. 
So, that is what we call it as uh, monolayers. So, uh, monolayers to multilayers and then you can transcend to a three dimensional lattice. So, just with few atoms deposited on a single crystal substrate, what is the magnetic origin of any material that we can talk about. For example, uh, iron for, uh, for that matter, alpha iron is a BCC which is a magnetic material whereas, gamma iron is a FCC uh, compound, but it is not a material of choice because it is non magnetic. But once we construct, we can see what is the minimum thickness that is needed when you grow it on a single crystal when it transcends from FCC to a BCC compound. And I have shown you how critically we can monitor and thanks to all the characterization tools that are available through which we can easily map a atomic level uh, deposition and from going from one monolayer to other monolayer how the magnetic influence happens. And as a uh, as an example I have shown the different uh, uh, growth mode it can go through a island mode it can go through a two dimensional mode it can go through island plus layer by layer mode and if that is the case then how we can realize different materials. For example, I talked about one dimensional wires. I talked about two dimensional wires or two dimensional films and also I had talked about artificial layers, uh, artificial layers of two immiscible alloys. For example, iron and copper is the example that I have shown how two elements which are not miscible at all can be made to form as alloy if you can forcibly grow a layer by layer growth of two dimensional layers. So, this is one classic example where you see if you start with just one atomic plane if you keep on going then you can get a bulk property somewhere around 8 to 10 monolayers. So, this is one of the very grand demonstration of how you can control in atomic scale a deposition to realize unknown um, alloys which are not known in mother nature. And also I have highlighted the use of another very useful uh, technique which has actually uh, covered almost all the range of materials that one can think of to translate from a bulk to a thin film form that is pulse laser deposition and how this pulse laser deposition operates, what are the limits to it and what is the condition in which we can do it. And most of the thin films that are being studied for device application today especially from oxide electronic point of view it is all governed by pulse laser deposition because it is very versatile and we can easily mod modulate the conditions for making oxide uh, electronics. Just to show one view graph of what we have discussed earlier we can make very sharp interfaces between a substrate this uh, LA uh, Oh, lanthanum aluminate is a substrate whereas, uh, lanthanum manganese oxide is the material that you are uh, depositing and you can see very clearly each dot is nothing but an atom and on each atom you can see the regularity with which the uh, lattices are growing and we call this as a epitaxial growth. So, epitaxial growth can be affected uh, on a very uh, a very very so sophisticated way in an atomic level dimension uh, especially when you adopt a pulse laser deposition view. And another e equally useful technique that I have uh, projected in this course is pulse electron deposition. This is not just uh, confined only to uh, metallic materials, but the chief advantage of this is to extend to any sort of material including semiconductors and insulators. As an example, I have also shown to you how this uh, um, the process can be made and uh, one example that I have discussed earlier is to bring in a rich chemistry between organic and inorganic interface. Iron, PTFE, iron, this is a trilayer, how we can make such devices here. These are fabricated at IIT and you can see that each of the layers have a very clear morphology from the AFM pictures and this sort of trilayer devices can be made to even observe um, <coughs> the critical dimension that is needed for this uh, tunneling uh, magneto resistive device to operate. And I have also shown that what is the thickness limit at which this uh, device can be made and uh, how difficult it is to control this thickness because you are talking about a two dimensional growth. 
And then we have uh, looked uh, into many useful characterization techniques, especially limited to some which are very sophisticated and they carry rich information into any material that you study. So, in characterization techniques we have looked at several issues uh, basically on x-ray diffraction, but I have also looked in uh, looked more uh, carefully into x-ray absorption studies uh, which is a light source experiment and how, what are the principle behind this uh, x-ray absorption spectroscopy and what is uh, that we infer out of it. We have seen that in detail and the source for x-ray absorption spectroscopy is a synchrotron radiation where your uh, beam is accelerated and it comes out with the very high kinetic energy as a result you have very high resolution even to atomically very very low level percentage of uh, material is there in your compound then you will be able to resolve it with a lot of certainty. So, uh, we have seen how a synchrotron source is different from a traditional x-ray source that we use in our x-ray diffraction techniques and what information that we can get out of it and we also looked at uh, other um, uh, surface analysis techniques which are there. I could not uh, deal with you uh, uh, with, uh, with, with these techniques ion spectroscopies uh, in detail for want of time, but we have looked more carefully into another uh, technique that is XPS x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And then I have also discussed about a very a fairly simple technique which does not call for much material preparation or sophisticated instrument which is thermal analysis. We call it TGA combined with the DTA and DSC uh, all these are a combined thermal analysis techniques by which we can get several useful informations which are listed here and I have discussed in details how this thermal analysis technique although it looks very very simple it can provide rich uh, evidences into the mechanistic ap approaches of material synthesis. Even in this lecture I have shown you how zinc uh, benzthiazole complexes give a clue to why we can easily dope manganese on uh, zinc oxide. <coughs> and uh, we have seen all this uh, um, principles in detail with examples and uh, lastly we have taken up uh, several case studies of different materials which are uh, functionally important. Some materials are uh, important from the electronic properties, some from the uh, photonic properties and fr some from magnetic point of view and uh, we have taken you through a course of case studies where in each lecture we have discussed one particular group of materials and <coughs> here we have highlighted colossal drop in, uh, in resistance in a series of comp compound one in bulk and which is actually related to manganese three dimensional manganese and we have looked at uh, multi layers this sort of combination of iron chromium which also paved the way through several Nobel prize winning work and uh, today whatever we are handling uh, in terms of iPod or many of the memory storage devices are mainly due to the phenomena of magneto resistance and I have shown you several examples of how we can um, study these compounds. One of the uh, compounds that show a huge drop in resistance is this perovskite manganese which I have um, uh, distinctly uh, mentioned as a genie inside a small lattice. It is just a small unit cell, but the rich chemistry that you understand by doping the manganate uh, uh, site and the lanthanum site brings about several combination of electronic and magnetic features. Therefore, we have studied that in detail uh, and uh, just to remember what is important we just coined three words three letters called XRD uh, just to easily remember XRD X for the, um, the amount of doping that you can do R for the average size that governs the perovskite and the dimensionality how we can tune the magnetic property in this materials. And also I have highlighted to you how uh, these compounds uh, the multi layers are useful in rotating the magnetic uh, alignment. So, with the magnetic field and without the magnetic field how a antiferromagnetically aligned material gets ferromagnetically aligned in uh, one direction as a result you see a drop in resistance as a function of uh, field. And uh, this is the magneto resistance 
So, we have seen that in detail and also we had one lecture exclusively to highlight the need for uh, superconductivity because it affects uh, the, the electric sec sector power sector uh, in a greater way and we have seen how chemistry has played a vital role in bringing about new discoveries. As you see here these are all alloys or intermetallics which has shown superconductivity below 35 40, dig 40 Kelvin for very long time for over 70 years we have lived with this intermetallics, but thanks to the materials chemistry which has really skyrocketed this TC in just 2-3 years time starting from 1986 where we have seen a tremendous improvement in highlighting the high TC uh, story and as you see here the uh, TC has now reached up to 160, but this is not enough for functional applications and to realize room temperature superconductivity we need to look for newer material although the cuprates have by and large held this uh, excitement for long time, but we are actually running uh, short of ideas. We are not able to improve more than a three layer cuprate morphology as a result we are not able to transcend beyond 160 uh, Kelvin for a long time. So, what is need of the R is a room temperature super uh, conductor which can show absolute resistance without any um, uh, without any uh, resistance and that can actually transcend to be the material of choice. So, lot of research is still going on there are um, some excitements along the way like magnesium bromide has shown a view that borates can also offer excitement in the same field, but this is not enough because magnesium borate shows uh, TC below 45 K and that is not enough. So, to stick on to the story of high temperature superconductivity we need to look for something which can, which can go much more closer to room temperature. So, such research has to be engineered and materials chemistry will be very important. We also looked at another um, important field that is uh, uh, the new carbon um, additives in the carbon family and uh, we also saw uh, the emergence of uh, fullerenes, uh, nanotubes and uh, graphene which has added to our understanding of uh, the traditional understanding of graphite and diamond. And we looked into several aspects of the structure properties that are related. We looked at uh, how uh, the way the um, nanotubes are rolled uh, from a simple two dimensional uh, carbon uh, sheet how we can get a semi metal or metal or a, a semiconductor uh, carbon nano, uh, nanotubes and whether it is a single wall or a multi wall all depends on how the uh, configuration is. And to make this more useful for other applications we have also looked at the several substitutions that can go one is exohedral fullerenes where you can actually cap it with some metal centers in order to use this for applications. So, these are called exohedral fullerenes this is one with the uh, osmium as a core the other one with the iridium as a core we have to design new materials for functional applications. We also have looked uh, into some of the uh, <coughs> examples of photonic materials and uh, we understood uh, from uh, one uh, couple of lectures on organic photon photonics how this organic molecules can be used for OLED applications. One such uh, important example is the um, emissive layer that uh, which which is very much responsible for tuning color in organic LEDs and what uh, what is the role of the whole transport layer, what is the role of electron transport layer and how materials synthesis is very important in designing different molecules. We have looked into the basic uh, understanding of how this uh, OLED operates and uh, um, apart from all this internal reflection loss how we can improve on the quantum efficiency which we harvest from the singlet exciton. So, we looked into the uh, EL process which is responsible for getting a um, very good uh, LED response and we have seen also several examples uh, to show how um, important device making is uh, is crucial in a LED structure because 
what you see as a photoluminescent behavior of a particular compound need not necessarily be translated to a electroluminescent behavior. For example, if you take the case of zinc uh, benzthiazole as a active material, you see it can give a white light against a green light which is predicted mainly because of the broadening that happens in the voltage structure and that is reflected due to a phenomena called exemplex. So, although you can make material, making a device has its own uh, demand and therefore, that is very crucial. So, the engineering part of it or the device fabrication point of it has to go hand in hand with the material tuning and therefore, material synthesis is going to be very very important. And then we also looked at several examples of phosphor materials, how they are used in today's CRT applications and what are the need for it. And uh, uh, one other lecture, we looked more closely into polymer based solar cells and uh, what are the applications of that, how a traditional solar cell will behave and what are the parameters that we should look for to fine tune the material so that we can get maximum efficiency. And uh, we looked at some of the popular compounds that are used as, uh, um, as uh, acceptors and donors which can generate excitons. For example, this is a hybrid molecule of fullerene that is used as an electron acceptor, PCBM is used as an electron acceptor and this sort of fluorine molecules are actually used as uh, electron donors and how the combination of these will affect the <coughs> Uh, photoluminescent uh, f uh, the solar uh, conversion energy conversion and uh, uh, the last of all that we have seen in uh, solar cells is the disensitized solar cell and uh, that seems to have a greater efficiency than any of the heterojunction solar cells and uh, we we have also looked into other examples of uh, materials which are promising for application in solar cells in essence, if we look at uh, both the electronic materials and the photonic materials, uh, what is the forecast and what, what do we have to look forward to and where do we go from here. There are some useful articles which has appeared um, in nature materials and other nature magazines which I just want to highlight one or two just to show wh what are the limitations that we face in today's materials chemistry and what are the challenges that are ahead of us. Uh, here is an article on a model ferromagnetic semiconductor a interview with the Nitin has brought about the need for understanding the material synthesis and here is a, a prediction on gallium nitride doped with uh, uh, manganese which shows ferromagnetism. And uh, this has been studied uh, as a model compound for all the dilute magnetic semiconductors. Um, when, he, when he was asked about one question, uh, whether materials aspect are well understood uh, as of now, um, what Nitin has to say is that it is yes and no, because <coughs> what he has found is that under very high sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, fabrication uh, conditions, uh, a very clean uh, dilute magnetic phase could be made and in other cases it has been a contra uh, controversial results. Therefore, what he says is uh, <coughs> growth based on MB method seems to be by far the safest route where you do not get into any issue of uh, external impurities adding to the confusion. Therefore, what is important that we need to understand uh, in understanding ferromagnetism at room temperature in semiconductors, we need still more refined uh, parameters uh, both for, uh, from characterization point of view as well as from synthesis point of view. But what has been told so far is that uh, using uh, MBE, they have attempted even to dope up to 24 percent of manganese in gallium uh, arsenide, but yet what they could not understand is even though they increased the doping level, they could not increase the TC because if, uh, if it has to obey the Weigert's rule, then with more and more of manganese doping in the semiconductor, you should have seen a little bit of linearity in the increase in TC which they have not found. 
So, lot more sophistication is needed to elucidate the origin of uh, room temperature ferromagnetism. <coughs> and here is another interview uh, with uh, Scott Chambers who has worked on uh, semiconductors for a very long time and uh, question asked to him is, is the magnetism in dilute magnetic semiconductors which is truly ferromagnetic. And uh, one of the questions that was posted to Scott is, do you think we have better tools today to elucidate the origin of ferromagnetism? And the answer is yes. And he says, in my view, one of the most useful and positive outcomes in the research of high TC DMS has been the refinement of experimental tools that can zero in on the magnetic dopant and elucidate the bonding environment. The characterization tools that he has highlighted or X-ray absorption studies as I highlighted to you uh, in the previous slides, then X-ray linear dichroism, X-ray circular dichroism because that is the one which will tell whether the, the light that is coming out of this photonic material is plane polarized or not. Therefore, you need such, uh, such um, very critical uh, diagnostic tools to understand if truly what we are talking about magnetic semiconductors is true or not. So, uh, we can sort of say that the research is mature in order to understand whether there is an intrinsic ferromagnetism or not or whether it is coming from any external impurities as we suggest. And here is another commentary made by uh, Hono and uh, co-workers, a window to the future of spintronics where he says that a paramagnetic state of a material can be driven into a ferromagnetic state by electrically driving that to be a ferromagnet and this is the principle of a dilute magnetic semiconductor and if we call any material to be truly a um, dilute magnetic semiconductor then it has to display a behavior of this sort where with different operation voltage you can see a ferromagnetic loop is emerging at a critical temperature of 22.5 K. So, if, if you design any material and you truly call this to be a, a dilute magnetic semiconductor, then it has to show a <coughs> gate vol a voltage dependence uh, of resistance against uh, uh, field. And this is a resistance uh, against field plot which shows a hysteresis with different gate voltage. So, this is one of a uh, uh, important signature that we should have in mind when we try to generate a magnetic material and this material is supposed to be a room temperature ferromagnet then this is the sort of response that you would look for. And another uh, important uh, area that has been uh, recently highlighted is high efficiency dye sensitized solar cell about which we have talked in the earlier slide with the ferrocene based electrolytes. As you know in dye sensitized solar cell we have the electrolyte which is usually a iodide, iodine um, uh, electrolyte and one of the reason that this has a severe limitation although you have a very good uh, uh, efficiency uh, of the order of 12 percent is that it is corrosive in nature and therefore uh, it is more complex in understanding the redox chemistry there. So, this is a group which has recently published in Nature Chemistry where they have replaced the iodine iodide uh, electrolyte with the ferrocene ferrocenium single electron redox couple which is fairly a good one a stable molecule and using this they have improved on the energy efficiency up to 7.5 percent and uh, these are emerging stories from dye sensitized solar cell and these are very practical and very useful uh, easy to fabricate but the chemistry that is going on in this dye sensitized solar cell has to be trimmed or modified in a much better way and this is the um, uh, the uh, organic sensitizer which they have used and uh, one of the uh, ferrocene based uh, dye sensitized solar cell seems to have a efficiency up to 7.5 interestingly they have a, a very good uh, open circuit voltage and the fill factor is up to 73 which is not a bad number as you see from this curve. And another uh, important advancement in the um, solar cell is the use of uh, organic semiconductor. In this case it is uh, a rubirine based one which has a symmetry, it is a symmetric molecule 
and this molecule seems to be able to undergo a singlet fission into two triplets and this triplet seems to be increasing the photocurrent therefore the efficiency of the solar cell is very easily um, uh, manageable or we can improve on the efficiency. The point here that we need to understand is if we can get very good photocurrent and then we need to form this layer rubidine layer in a very very critical dimension and the dimension of this has to be nearly uh, in uh, 2 to 10 nanometers. So, control of this rubidine which is a organic film and to control in that dimensions is the challenge. So, if we can do that then we can bring about a new generation of a solar cell with the uh, with the organic semiconductors like rubidine. So, there are a lot of forecasts and new developments that are coming in this fashion which needs to be taken into consideration. We also looked at uh, another uh, important module uh, on magnetic materials mainly we tried to look at the various group of magnetic materials and then we looked specific examples of ferromagnetic materials which are useful for functional applications and then we also looked in this module into several classification of this ferromagnetic materials and <clears throat> one of the example that we touched upon is the magnetic storage and how particulate mediated uh, um, materials and the thin film mediated materials can affect the magnetic storage in a larger way. And uh, another important application of this magnetic materials is the shape memory alloy which has found application in variety of areas including biomedical devices. We also looked at how the uh, cardiovascular stents are made of this shape memory alloys which can actually hold a very critical uh, technology with high degree of specificity and we looked at examples of how this ferro uh, shape memory alloys can be used for various design of this material and this is one of the other um, uh, view graph which we have seen in one of the earlier course uh, showing what is critical about the design of this shape memory alloys. Lastly, I would like to uh, conclude uh, by acknowledging uh, all the uh, <coughs> people who are involved in this uh, uh, course uh, especially I would like to record my thanks to Ministry of Human Resource and Development who have taken uh, extra pain to bring these lectures uh, on a web based mode video based uh, lectures so that many people can be profited. I hope that these lectures on materials chemistry would be useful and specially want to record my thanks to NPTEL organizers the nodal point has been IIT Chennai. I want to thank the coordinator and the director of IIT for letting me do this course and it has been a challenging time. Uh, so, I want to record my appreciation also to administration at IIT Kanpur who have provided a very excellent uh, recording studio and uh, the friendly atmosphere provided by the NPTEL crew at IITK has been fantastic and we have enjoyed their courtesy especially recording and editing has been superb. So, I want to place my record uh, uh, thanks on record for all that they have invested and I hope that this uh, series of lectures that I have provided would bring some perception into uh, the challenges that a chemist uh, will face in a materials world and how important a simple chemistry principle can take you long way into applications. So, I just conclude with this and uh, uh, also thanks to the viewers.